Good morning. Uh, so page 1503, have it open, and you can check that I'm telling you what it actually says. Uh, we're in Matthew 3, verses 1 to 12. Let's pray as we sit. Loving God, would you open our hearts to your word, and your word to our hearts this day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so it doesn't feel like a year since I last preached on John the Baptist, but evidently it is. Uh, I don't know how many sermons you've heard on John the Baptist um, in, in, your, in your lifetime. This may even be the first one. Um, but uh, um, I feel like I'm talking about John the Baptist a lot. Um, and when you talk about Bible characters a lot, it's easy, um, speak for myself, to miss things. Um, so I'm going to be reading through the text as I speak, just to make sure we don't miss any of the fine details. Uh, so it's the second week of Advent, and, um, and Advent is that time when we're both looking for the coming of Christ, um, and we are also... Um, looking, remembering the first time when Christ came, so the first and second advent. Um, and I find that puts us in this place of being quite confused, because when we're thinking, well, Advent's about Christmas, it kind of is, but also it's not. It's about Jesus coming again. And John the Baptist is one who comes with this message. Uh, anyone who's in the Scouts um, has probably got the word, be prepared, etched on your wallet, the back of your arm, I don't know. Uh, be prepared is the, is the motto. Um, uh, one of the mottos that the Scouts um, uses around the world, be prepared. And if you want to sum up John the Baptist's uh, message, it is be prepared. Be prepared. Um, in those days, Matthew 3, 1, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The wilderness of Judea um, is not kind of like the wilderness of, of the Golden Ears um, up here. It's, it's much more barren. It's kind of nothingness and emptiness, but the odd, um, the odd bush and shrub here and there. So it's kind, of, it's kind of wild, not in the sense of the Wild West, but wild in the sense that there really isn't much there, um, and it's kind of open space. And so there was John in the wilderness, and he was saying this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. If you'd like to write down the, the three points of the sermon, first point, repent. Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And that word repent, um, we can think of repent um, in terms of confession, in terms of saying sorry for things. Um, when I prepare people for baptism, uh, they have to repent of their sins. And uh, if, I'm being, um, if I'm being kind, typically I don't tell them what that means. And I say, what does it mean to you to repent of your sins? And then they sit there on the spot and say, oh... Um, and normally have amazing answers. Repent of your sins. But the repent here is, is kind of a different kind of repentance that John the Baptist is talking about. He's talking about a repentance as in a turning back to God. We live in a country that is trying to turn as far away from God as possible, it seems. It seems. Um, uh, most of us would call this time of year kind of Christmas time. I mean, officially it's Advent, but we'd call it Christmas. Um, and last night we were in the middle of Maple Ridge where they now have Winterfest. Probably so nobody gets offended. Um, have you noticed that, or was that just me? Winterfest, because we can't call it Christmas, because we might offend some people. And um, interestingly, this week in the news, um, in, in the middle of Canada, there's a church of sorts, which is calling itself the Atheist Church of Central Canada. And the Atheist Church of Central Canada has been in the news because they have been to court um, because they're in a battle with the CRA. The Canada Revenue Agency um, is saying, no, you cannot have charity status on the basis of being a religious group because you are not a religious group because you don't believe in anything. And the Atheist Church of Central Canada has said, but that's not fair. Um, and uh, so it's quite interesting. Uh, you'll find it on, uh, on CBC. Go and, go and read it if you're interested in, in reading what the court said. But they said there are a number of things that you need to be defined as a religious group and therefore have charity status in Canada. And one of those is that you have to have a belief system in something. And the very definition of atheism is that you don't believe in anything. And, and, um, and they're quite upset by that. So that's quite fun. Um, <laughs> forgive me if you're... No, don't forgive me if you're part of that church um, watching online. 
The thing of repentance is it's a calling back to God. Um, and for once, it seems this week, a sensible decision has been made in favor of a religious group, which is all religions, uh, by saying, if you don't believe in anything, you cannot have the status of saying we're doing the work of a religious group. What does it mean to come back to God? What does it mean to repent? Um, John the Baptist is, um, is kind of misnamed, really. Uh, because although John did go around baptizing people, that wasn't the point. That wasn't the point. His big message is be prepared. Be prepared. One commentator puts it like this. John's title, the Baptist, can obscure what in fact the main thrust of his ministry was. An announcement of the imminent judgment of God and of the coming of the greater one. In the light of this expectation, he called people to repentance to prepare them for the coming test, and it was in token of this repentance that he administered baptism. That's quite a long title, isn't it? John the Baptist is quicker. John, the bringer of imminent judgment, doesn't sound as fun. Uh, but the point he's making, and I've said this the last two weeks really, is that Jesus is coming. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we prepared? How do we make sure we're prepared? Living in a relationship with Jesus. And that's what John is saying. He's saying, repent. Come back to God. Come back to God. If you have a look in Matthew 3, verse 4, uh, look down. Um, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Uh, so... Um, the point of this is it's showing John is out there, he's in the wilderness, he's, he's wearing, um, it might sound obscure to us to be wearing a coat of camel's hair, I, mean, I don't know, uh, maybe it's the fashion, um, but uh, a coat of camel's hair, but the thing is, he just wore what was there, um, the, the leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I wonder if anyone has ever tried a locust. I imagine that locusts taste disgusting, um, and I've never tried one. I've tried various things, but I've not tried a locust. Um, and, and I'm guessing that's why we get the locusts and wild honey, because I guess if you put the two together, maybe it makes them nicer. Um, I, I once, for a sermon illustration, decided it would be fun to get some locusts. And, uh, and so I went, um, I first of all tried to find some made of candy, because I figured somebody must, in a, in a sweet shop, make some candy. Locusts couldn't find them anywhere. Um, and then I thought, well, um, uh, maybe I could get some plastic ones. You know, and kind of, so I was trying to find, and, and I think I did manage to find on Amazon, you can buy a box of 100 plastic bugs, but I thought there'd only be one or two locusts in there, and that would be a lot of money for, for you know, I didn't need cockroaches and things, I just needed locusts. Uh, so then I found a website, which is called speedybugs.com, and if you go to speedybugs.com, it turns out you can buy a box of 100 live locusts. Um, but, you know... It wouldn't go down very well if the locusts were released in church and started eating the pews, would it? Well, maybe it would. <laughs> so, so I never did it. Um, but the thing was, that was the that was he ate what he could find. He lived off the land. So he's this kind of strange man out there who has this message. Isaiah said, "A voice of one calling in the wilderness: Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him." He had a message, and his message was, "Be prepared." Be prepared for Jesus' coming. And what do you need to do to be prepared? Repent. When you've done that, confess your sins. So verse 6, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Um, when we do baptism today in the church, we use the font, which is normally a bowl, which is on here underneath this, um, and uh, our Advent wreath. Um, and we use a small bowl, and it's a symbolic um, baptism, so it's not full immersion. Anglicans do do full immersion, except typically Anglicans don't spend the money building um, tanks to do full immersion in. That is really the reason why Anglicans don't do full immersion in Canada, is because um, it's cheaper to get a little bowl and make it on a stand than to dig out a big thing. Um, but go and see the, the most Catholic of Anglicans in, in the Diocese of Ottawa, and they'll tell you, because uh, we had one at Diocesan Conference. He said, we should be building massive baptistries in our church and making a wonderful thing of full immersion baptism. Um, but so for, for us, when we think of baptism, we think of a bit of a splashing. 
Um, I'll be doing some baptisms in, um, in two weeks' time, a baptism, unless anyone else wants to come forward, and we'll do more than one. But I've got a baptism coming up on December 22nd. Um, and if you've seen me do a baptism, I kind of try and get whoever it is as wet as I can within the realms of, of about you know, a cup of water. Um, but that's nothing compared to what John was doing. And yet what John was doing, even in fully immersing someone, that wasn't enough. Because they confess their sins and they're baptized by him. But then he says to them, uh, jumping down to verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John's message is, is this is just symbolic. The real work of baptism comes from the Holy Spirit and fire, and that comes from Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes, the Holy Spirit will be at work, and that's when the real work happens. Repent. Are we turning towards God? Confess our sins. We do that week by week. We've done it already. We, we say sorry. And, and we confess those things that separate us from God. And we're reminded that we're forgiven people. And that song we sang, um, the second song we sang, um, I can never remember what it's called, but, uh, you know, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am, that one. Um, and it just reminds us that we are forgiven people. We're children of God. In my Father's house, there's a place it's our Father's house, and there's a place for all of us there. That's the truth uh, that we're reminded of this morning as we've confessed our sins and been reminded of the forgiveness that we can experience in Christ. But John says, but it, that's all just the beginning. The Christmas parade last night in Maple Ridge, anyone, anyone there? Um, and uh, at the Christmas parade, um, we were kind of standing in Peace Memorial Park waiting for the parade to begin. And there were, um, the Santa came round first. Not the real Santa, because as you know, the real Santa is currently on a train in um, Airdrie, Alberta, I believe. If you're following the Canadian Pacific uh, holiday train, I think Santa's on there. Um, but, but it was just a lookalike we had here in Maple Ridge. I don't think there's any children that will be offended by that statement now, because they're out there. So um, sorry if I've upset anyone. Um, but uh, so the real Santa uh, is coming uh, in, a, in a few weeks' time on a train, because obviously Santa travels by train in Canada. Um, but so this was, a, this was a Maple Ridge Santa who walked around and we thought, oh, something's happening. And then followed by Santa was, um, were three people on bicycles and yellow jackets. Did you see them? They were the bike patrol. And their job was to make sure uh, that the way was clear. They were preparing the way, making sure that none of the children were going to get run over by the parade, because that would be a bit annoying and slow things down if, if people were in the way. So they kept coming around, and then after them came some other people with really loud voices, and they were shouting, parade's coming, stand back! You know? And there's all this preparing for the way of the parade. And then it came. John is one who is preparing the way for Jesus, but he's not doing it so much in terms of saying, stand back, Jesus is coming. He's saying, get ready, Jesus is coming. Have you repented? Have you turned back to God? Are you okay? Have you confessed your sins? Are you in a good place with God? Is there some stuff that you need to lay down? Come be baptized. That baptism is a symbolic preparation saying, yes, I am ready. And then he says, verse 11, after me, after me comes one who is more powerful than I. After me, after me is coming Jesus Christ. And when he comes, you'll know about it. Because his baptism is not with a tiny bit of water or a massive amount of water. His baptism is with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so we look for the coming of Christ who um, John points to. And the other part of that is we have the same job as John. Not that we have to eat locusts and wild honey and wear a camel's fur coat with a leather belt around our waist and, and, and sandals. We're not living in Israel, Palestine. But that our job, like John, is to point people towards Christ. How do we point people towards Christ? 
in a country, in a world that seems not interested in finding out about Jesus, isn't interested in, in experiencing the peace and the joy that comes with knowing and loving him. We can do that this month with, um, by taking one of the Christmas flyers and, and inviting someone. Maybe we know someone who would love to come and do something Christmassy, but wouldn't walk into church. The Bethlehem walk will take place mostly outside. And they can come and dress up. Uh, children can. In, um, I guess adults can. Can adults dress up at the Bethlehem Walk? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing a nod from the back there. So whoever, whoever they are, come dress up as, 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 a, as someone from the nativity scene. Um, invite them to that. Invite them to one of the carol services. Um, and if they want, there's one at the pub tonight. There's some tickets left. Um, it includes food. It's $20, which is, just covers the cost of the food. And we're going to sing carols. We'll be at the ranch from 6 o'clock. Invite. And if you can't invite people, um, but you use social media, anyone use social media? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, St. George's is there. And every time you click like on one of our posts, every time you do that, you do what John did. You help people see Christ. How? It's to do with algorithms. I'm not going to go into algorithms in the sermon, but trust me, every time you click like, uh, it helps to get the word out. Even among people who have already liked the page, they won't necessarily see it. But when Facebook decides that 20 people like this picture or this post, they go, oh, this must be important. There I am, I'm talking about algorithms. Um, trust me, that really helps. So if you think to yourself, I'm not an evangelist, there's a small thing you can do, and it's click the like button if you see something you like. If you, if you see a, um, the news video online, um, it didn't work earlier today. If we can't get it to work, then we'll email it out. If you click like, then that makes the, the internet think that people want to see our news video, and it gets out there to more people. A small step you can take to follow the footsteps of John the Baptist, of pointing the way to Jesus. Because the reality is, People are interested. People are interested in Jesus. And they're most interested in Jesus at this time of year. So John says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It has come and, and it is coming. They confess their sins. And so we do the same week by week as we gather. But the point of it all, John says, is after me, after me, Jesus is coming. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you excited for Christ to, to return? As I finish, um, we're going to sing a couple of songs, uh, the first of which is, is the hymn, Come, Thou Long-Expected Jesus. And it reminds us we've been expecting him for a while, and he hasn't come back yet. And so we live in this world that's broken. And we talk about Jesus coming back and making all things new. But for 2,000 years, Christians have been waiting for this to happen, and it hasn't. And so we sit in that uneasiness of knowing there are people around us who are broken and sick. There are members of our congregation who aren't here today because they're in hospital this morning. There are people who are at home because they, they can't get out of the house for whatever reason. And so... We'll have our prayer time, and, and maybe there's someone that you'd like to pray for. You can pray for them where you are. We'll have a prayer ministry team at the side. Maybe for you, you, you feel um, a, a burden around this repentance and confession. Um, there's something about going to pray with someone and saying, would you pray for me that this burden's taken away? You don't have to tell them what it is. Just ask for prayer. So we'll do that as we sing.